man who's taught, uh, uh, John, actually, uh, uh, when I agreed to come and give the keynote, he said, oh, you should give a talk on value semantics and, uh, and, and runtime polymorphism. And for sure. Um, uh, this particular talk has a um, You see there is a demo of Photoshop history. Uh, that's different than the history of Photoshop. Uh, uh, we'll look at the, the feature inside of Photoshop in a little bit. But Craig Gilly, who has been my boss on Photoshop for, for a number of years, and he's now you know, something like CTO of applications at Apple, uh, gave me a call a few years ago and said, so, you know, we did this whole history thing in Photoshop, and, and you know, it started out as this very complicated mechanism, and over time we made it simpler. And could you come give a talk at Apple to just some of my guys and, and let them know, know a bit about this and, and how you do this? And I said, sure. And I went over and uh, uh, opened my laptop and started with a blank screen in an IDE and uh, built up the code for the feature in Photoshop in less than an hour and demonstrated it. And that's what we're going to do here, uh, except I'm not going to do it live. So after I gave the talk there, I was asked to give the talk inside of Adobe. And then I was asked to give the talk uh, for a bunch of new hires at, at Adobe. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't available on the day to give it. So I was forced to put together a slide set to write the code. And you'll see what I mean by that. Um, uh, so that's kind of the history of this talk. So we're going to start uh, uh, with some definitions because a lot of people don't really know what a value type is. It's, it's, it's a little squishy. Right? How many people here think they know, kind of know? Something? Yeah. I mean, one way to think about it is, is a value type is, is just an object that behaves like an int or like one of your built-in types, right? I can pass it around as a value. Um, I can also modify it in place, okay? Um, uh, so, so a value type is a correspondence between entities with common properties or species and sort of values. This is the definition coming out of, of elements of programming, okay? okay? But it really means that a value type isn't isn't just something abstract, but it's something concrete that has some meaning and semantics. So, so an object type is having for storing values, of course, from value type in memory. Uh, since this stuff is in memory, we'll simply use it to use type in an object type. An object type is a representation of a concrete entity as a value in memory. Okay? So, so what we're really saying is, is you know, int is just a bunch of bits in memory, okay? Uh, uh, but we have this notion that match that to a number, okay? So there's this relationship between the pattern of bits in memory and a concrete mean of P that we can kind of hang on to, right? You know, one one means three for those, those bits, okay? Now, the physical nature of the machine, meaning that you know, a machine has memory, so we have bits of memory, means that that imbues kind of all types with a set of common properties. And these occur over and over and over in every language. Why are object types copyable? Okay, right? I can duplicate them, I can make two of them. Uh, 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 we've been learning a lot about move and a, a note from move. That's just inherent in the machine, uh, a quality comparison is inherent in the physical nature of the machine, okay? So we refer to that common set of types as, as regular, and I just heard, you know, Dave, Dave Abraham's here, keeps threatening to give me a t-shirt that says, I'm a regular type. <laughs> so, so I entered assert that all types are inherently regular, okay? Which means that if you're writing a type that's not copyable, it isn't that the type itself isn't 
isn't copyable, it means that as a matter of policy, you're preventing it from being copyable. Okay? But you could copy it. Okay, so semantics and syntax. We also get a bit of confusion here. Uh, we define an operation in terms of the operation's semantics, right? Assignment is a procedure, if the two objects of the same type, that makes the first object equal to a second without modifying the second. Okay. What's that? That's not an assignment. That's not an assignment? Yeah, yeah, move semantics is not an assignment. It's exactly. A <laughs> it's a different operation. Okay, so choosing the same sim syntax but the same semantics enables code reuse and avoids combinatorial, inter combinatorial interfaces. Okay? Uh, uh, so that's one of the key ideas behind the notion of generic programming, right? If we define the operations on our types in terms of the semantics, and we use the same name, then we can use the same code to operate on, on different types, and the code will behave correctly. Okay. So, choosing the same name for said that uh, C++ has defined semantics for operation on built-in types, including assignment, copy, equality, address dialog, uh, etc. Okay. There aren't operations for, for all of, of the regular operations that are just inherent in a regular type. For example, there is no standard way to get the complete area of an object, where the area is all the bits that it use, uses in memory. Every object has that property, but there's just no standard way to get to it. Okay. So, I have to look over here. I can't see at that angle. Uh, regular types, uh, where the regular operations are implemented with the standard names, they're said to have value semantics. Okay. Uh, when uh, user objects are always referred to indirectly through a shared reference or a pointer. The objects are said to have reference semantics. Okay. So this is what distinguishes, say, a language like Java, where every time you create a user type, you're always referring to it indirectly. So we say there that we have reference semantics. Why? When I assign two of those objects, by right, assigning two ints in Java, is not the same as assigning with the same syntax to user-defined objects in Java, right? Okay. So, value semantics is very similar to functional programming, okay? So, in fact, we can somewhat define one in terms of the other. Given the transformation f, we can define an equivalent action such that a of x, where that's going to modify x, is equivalent to x equals f of x. Okay? So, so one way to think about programming with value semantics is that you're doing functional programming. You're trying to maintain this idea of, of being able to locally reason about your code. Okay? Uh, uh, but you're not denying the fact that the machine has memory and that I can do in situ operations on that. Do people get that? Questions? Lots of nothing. That's pretty good. Um, okay. So, what's the problem with shared semantics? Okay. Or reference semantics, yeah, where we're sharing mutable objects in this case. David Abraham told us that it's constant. It is value semantics. Go into a discussion on that. Contention. What's that? Contention. Yeah, contention. So, actually, if you look at it in terms of just the individual types, right, you kind of do have value semantics. When I copy my shared pointer, it's copying my shared pointer with value semantic operations. Okay? If I copy the object pointed to, I could make a copy of that with value semantic operations. So if I look at these things individually, we can say it has value semantics. Okay? The problem is, is the references, the arrows between them. Okay? 
And I'm not giving the talk here on references, but I could give a whole another you know, hour and a half long talk on references and how we deal with references uh, uh, in the value symmetric world. Um, so if we consider the individual types, we do have value semantics. Okay. But the problem is we tend not to think about things that way. When I've got a shared pointer to an object, right, I'm looking at it as if, well, I've got the object. Okay, so now what I've got is really two objects that intersect. Okay. So really, right, so same part, same thing as I just said there. So really, I've got this, this love fest going on here. <laughs> okay? So, so my object, conceptually in the program, <coughs> is this whole connected mess. Okay? Now, from just a semantic standpoint, I can view this whole thing as being a value, which I can copy. I just can't do it with a copy constructor. Right? <laughs> I could assign this whole thing, I just can't do it with an assignment operator, right? At any particular local point in code, I have a difficult time reasoning about the whole thing. Who here has ever called an API that returned a pointer, a shared pointer, or just a T star, and gone, do, do I have complete control of this object? Is it going to change out from under me? Do I delete it? Who owns this? Okay? Okay? That's what I mean by breaking your ability to reason locally. You look at this function and you're like, what does it do? I don't know. In order to understand what that function does, if you really have a shared pointer there, you have to also understand what the other piece of code is doing that also hangs on to that reference. Okay? Now, you might be in a situation where you've got clear guidelines and that's cut. But an awful lot of times, you pick up a piece of code and you're like, oh crap, I don't know. You gotta either go look at the implementation or look at the documentation. And you know, the worst case is, okay, well this thing really is shared, so well now what? You know, how am I gonna deal with this and make sure that I'm reasoning about this correctly? So that's what we mean by breaking local reasoning. There's one reason why functional programming is becoming so popular because when you're dealing with shared objects in a threaded environment, okay, now it's not just that that somebody could be modifying the object when you make a function call out from underneath you, but somebody could be modifying that shared object between any two instructions. Okay? Now you have no way to reason about, about that shared object. Okay? So Polymorphic types. So when I start to talk about value semantic programming, people say, well, but we have to have pointers. Pointers are required. Pointers are a fundamental part of object-oriented programming. Right? What happens? I've got a base class, and I inherit from that base class. Right? Right? That's our fundamental mechanism for object-oriented programming right now is inheritance. Right? So I've got Go ahead, Dave. Just want to point something out. It's it's not the the inheritance gets the pointers. It's the fact that now you have two objects with different sizes that you have to treat the same way. Exactly. Exactly. And that means you have that in Exactly. So inheritance implies different sized objects, which implies dynamic allocation, which implies pointers, which implies ownership issues, lifetime issues. Who owns the pointers? How long do they own the pointer? Okay. So, in my opinion, you know, inheritance as a way to implement polymorphism is the root of all evil in programming. Okay. So, if I could could eliminate anything in the language, it would be inheritance. And we're going to use inheritance in this talk, but we don't need to. <laughs> okay. So, if I could eliminate one feature. That would be it. Inheritance, in my opinion, is the root of all people. It's also wrong for another very fundamental way, which is there is no such thing as a polymorphic type. Okay? What's the definition of polymorphism? It's 
the ability to treat many types as if they were the same type. Okay? That is a requirement on the usage of a collection of types. Right? So when you say, I've got a polymorphic shape type, no. What you're really saying is in one piece of my code, I need to deal with a collection of things that satisfy the requirements of a shape. A rectangle okay, satisfies the requirements of a shape, but a rectangle itself is not inherently somehow polymorphic. Right? Right? So when I use inheritance on my type, okay, what I'm doing is I'm imposing the requirements of the use of my type onto the type itself. That's tightly coupling my objects with how my objects are being used. Okay? So, so think about an integer. If you did this to an integer, if you said, well, an integer is a number, so therefore an integer should have to inherit from some number base class. Okay? So a floating point number, well that's a number also, that should inherit from a number, right? It's also pseudo representation of a real, so maybe it should also inherit multiple inherit from a real class. Okay? Now in order to create an integer, I say you need to say new int. Okay? Okay. I know some languages, yeah? Sure. objects, 
And I started refer referring to it as the scooping the pumpkin problem. Right? Anybody ever try to scoop out a pumpkin? You try to get one little piece out, and you can't do it. There's just all these threads. Right? I try to pull out one object, and that inherits from this object, and that inherits from that object, and this other object. And there's no distinction between any object in one of those applications and the framework, right? They're completely entangled with the rest of the application, as entangled with the rest of the application as they are with the framework. Okay? So the fact that two products are sharing the same framework doesn't mean I can move anything from one to the other. Right? Right? Without scooping out the whole product and dumping that into the other product. Okay? So it was just a fallacy. As try, try as I might, I couldn't even find simple cases where it was true. So it's a wrong way to look at programming, and in my opinion, since, you know, since small talk time frame, we've been living under this assumption that, that you can build reusable systems out of object-oriented programming, and it almost seems to work because we can build roots that we can reuse, Okay? But we can't build components that we can reuse at the bottom. And try as we may, look in the industry, you'll find very few exceptions to that rule. Okay. So, we already talked about heap allocation and object lifetime, and that leads to garbage collection, which is one of my other things that if I could ever eliminate garbage collection from the face of the earth, I would do that. Uh, you know, anybody who knows, I'm always about how do I completely saturate the machine and uh, uh, having a generational garbage collector or something there under the hood means I can. Do you wish you could get rid of the GC and Wood? Uh, yes, I do wish I could. You know, if, if I were to to write my own replacement to Lua, it would be a little value semantic language with no garbage collection. Right? I mean, there are other things about Lua that I hate, like ranges are, instead of semi-open, are closed, and so you can't have an empty range, and indices are one-based, which is just wrong, and, right? <laughs> so Lua is a nice little simple language, it, it doesn't mean it's flawless. Okay, so as soon as we have these uh, pointers, that encourages us to have shared ownership, we start to have shared pointers, and the pro proliferation of what I've coined incidental data structures, which is when you have two shared pointers sharing the same object. That's really a data structure, but you don't have an explicit data structure. You have an incidental data structure, right? It's just somehow scattered about your code. Because it's not an explicit data structure, you can't reason about the darn thing without understanding all of your code. So I often say a shared pointer is as good as a global variable when it comes to reasoning about code. Okay, so a disclaimer here, uh, we're going to jump into code on the following slides. Um, uh, as have most people in this talk, I'm ignoring the proper use of header files, inline functions, namespaces are ignored for clarity. Right? We're just putting up the essence of the code here. Okay, so hello world in C++, looks like this. This is an introduction to my little virtual machine that I have on my slide deck here. Uh, we can execute that. We get the logo. Okay. <coughs> One thing that I always encourage young developers is to say, from the outset, write all of your code as a library. Right? It's kind of a little standalone library that people can use. Don't write it as a part of the application. Why? Because when you write as a library, trying to make it standalone, it means that you can write a little main main standalone test case and test it and make sure that it's okay and it helps to ensure that you're not that your little library is entangled up with the rest of the system. Okay? So write it everything you do as if it were a little standalone library, weak as pepper you can for the rest of the dependencies. So we're gonna write a little library here. We're gonna develop a little little teeny application. So we've got a notion of of an object type, which is just an integer, and we can draw our object, which is we're just going to put it to standard out. Um, and we've got a document type, which is just a vector of these objects, whatever they are, and we can draw our document type. Okay. So I can write a little 
program like this to create a document, put 0, 1, 2, 3 into our document, enter the document, and I get that as a result. Easy enough? Everybody follow? Okay, so what I just said, write all code in the library, reuse increases, increases your productivity, and running unit tests are simplified. So, object just an int, that's kind of boring, right? Maybe we've got a more sophisticated object. So, what if we made it a class? To keep things simple here, we're just going to wrap our integer into a class. So just for convenience, we're going to keep a draw function on the integer, but then we'll have a draw function on the object in terms of just drawing the underlying in integer. Okay. So we're going to make that change. Okay. The compiler is going to supply our member-wise copy and assignment operator, so let the compiler do the work. We have exactly the same code. We have exactly the same output. Okay. <coughs> So if we write our classes that behave like regular objects, like built-in types with value semantics, that increases our reuse, right? right? Writing code for our document here with our class object type is as simple for the developer as writing it for the int object type. They don't have to be concerned with newing these objects and managing their memory. They just create them. Okay. What if our object type was more complicated, though? Okay. Maybe we've got to manage some remote, remote resource. Okay. So we're going to make this more complicated. We're going to have our object contain some internal type, right? Which right now is just we're going to call it our int model. It just holds an integer. Okay, and we've got a pointer to that. So we're adding another level of redirection. Now, do your own memory management, right? We're going to delete our own object there. Don't impose the burden on the client, right? I could export my little int model here as a separate class and tell my client to do it. That's what I wanted to do. But there's no need. I can manage this thing. Okay. So, but we have our delete, so we're going to need a copy constructor. So let's fill that in. Okay. Important. Especially most of you people here know, but it's important that copy actually copies, right? So the semantic copies are to create a new object which is equal to and logically disjoint from the original. So the copy constructors must copy the object. And the compiler is free to elide the copies. So I've gotten in huge arguments with people at Adobe who have written copy constructors that don't copy. I'm like, I don't know what that means, okay? Because if the compiler elides that copy, what did it do if your copy constructor didn't copy and then wasn't called? Right? <laughs> right? So your copy constructor must make a copy. When a type manages remote parts, it's necessary to, to supply a copy constructor. And if you can't, or if you can't use an existing class such as a vector, Right to, to manage your remote parts for you. Now a vector has value semantics, so I could drop a vector in here, and then I wouldn't have to write that copy constructor. Okay. So now we need an assignment operator. So I'll write my assignment operator like this. I've seen one of these assignment operators here. Luckily, the, the, uh, in that talk, the author did what I'm about to do. Who sees problems with this assignment operator? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, it looks pretty good, though. Assignment is, needs to be consistent with copy. Okay. Generally, if we default construct something and then assign, it's equivalent to making a copy. So we've got that. We have this code. We execute it. We get the same output. Right. Okay. So sometimes this is referred to as a private implementation or people in idiom. See this quite a lot in code where I have an object wrapping another object to manage that resource. Now, now we've got our defects here. Some of you guys spotted it. Who didn't who doesn't spot the defects in this assignment operator? You guys are good. So new hires are like, no, it's correct. 
Okay, so we've got two problems here. If mu throws an exception, the object is left in an invalid state. And if we assign an object to itself, this is going to crash. Okay. So we're going to fix it in a C11 style here. We're going to use a unique pointer. So it's how it's going to be. So we're going to use a unique pointer. This is kind of nice because we get to delete our constructor because now unique pointer is going to manage that resource for us. Okay? And so now we're just going to make a copy and reset our unique pointer with the copy and return star this. Okay. Yep. The other nice just a copy. The other nice thing about the unique pointer is that we can't just get to write the copy from here. Yeah. That's because you just said all points and before you add the copy construct the copy is kind of simplified, it will generate a single one. That is true. That is true. This so. Yep. So <laughs> there you go. Okay. So this assignment satisfies the strong exception guarantee. Uh, I I contend that's a nice property for assignment to have. Um, uh, in this case, we could just assign into our underlying int model, and that would be more efficient. Um, uh, uh, we're going to see here in a little bit about how following a pattern similar to this uh, keeps our code simpler. And if you go back to my keynote yesterday, uh, uh, I'm less inclined to go through and heavily optimize my code up front these days. Okay, I'm preferring a much simpler way of writing C++. Right? So this is not my performance model. Okay, so we're going to mutate this code just a little bit so we can see what's going on here. So I'm going to do three things. I'm going to decorate my constructor and my copy operation just so they, they stream out so I can see when they're being called. And I'm going to rewrite my assignment operator before I was doing the copy and then resetting my pointer. So I'm going to rewrite it in this form where I do the copy explicitly on the whole class, and then I just move in my member and then return star this. So, so the reason why I'm going to do this is just to lift the, the copy out to call my copy constructor so we can see when it gets called when we are making copies. Okay? But the code's equivalent for the assignment operator. So quiz. <coughs> Given the previous slide, give you a chance to look at that again. Okay. So we got C four copy. What's this going to print? What's that? C four. Anybody disagree? Alright, we've got to move constructor in here yet. Uh, there is no destructor. We're letting the unique pointer handle it. C four. C four. Right, C4. What if we do it this way? Side of assignment, <clears throat> let's pass by value. Okay? And now we can just move the object internally, return star this. Okay? So we're just transmitting that, taking the copy out, lifting it up. Okay. As a general rule, I think if you're passing a sync argument by value, or if you're passing a sync argument, which is an argument you're going to store into your class, right? This occurs commonly in constructors, in containers, things like pushback, right? If I'm passing in a sync, sync argument, an object that I'm going to store in my class, or that I'm going to return from my class, right? Then I want to pass it by value 
and copy or move it in place. Copy anyways, lift it up into the signature. Yeah. How many people know this? Pretty good. It's got about half. So somebody's learning something. Okay. So now what's this it's gonna print? I heard one person say the same. Any other guesses? Ctor, Ctor, right, right. <coughs> Ctor, Ctor. Now we've got an R value coming back to our function for the object, and the compiler is free to align that. Okay. Now it's not mandatory that the compiler align that copy, but I don't know of a compiler that doesn't align the copy. And I've run an awful lot of code to an awful lot of compilers to test this. Even in debug builds, the RDO optimization holds pretty much across the board. Enough so that I'm comfortable telling people they can rely on. Visual Studio decides that, that they think it's clearer if they do this extra copy in the bug builds. And I've tried to deal with them about this, but they, they're not budget. That is, that is true. They didn't used to, but that is true. Oh, did they change this? Yeah. So, so but we're going to fix that anyways. So, so I like it a little bit. Visual Studio now in their debug builds does actually do the copy. Um, but it doesn't matter. We're going to fix it in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so in Howard's example, where he gives the graphs, he talks about explicitly deleting RDO. Okay. If I don't have kind of a single simple return statement for my function, right? The, the way RDO works is when I've got my function called there, it doesn't rely on anything in line, but in calling that function, there's space allocated on the, for the return, right? So the compiler down here just says, oh, well, we'll make that space be where our temporary x is, okay? So now, when we call our function, it's just going to construct the object right in place, right where we need it. That's how they Right in x. Right in x, right? I guess the compiler needs does. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. So if it's an argument that you're returning, that's going to disable RBO. Uh, uh, if it is a uh, uh, potentially if I have multiple return statements. Then the compiler's not going to know what to do about that, and that can disable RDO. Question colon. Uh, question colon can disable RDO. Okay. Okay. So it can be a little fragile. Okay. But we're still going to fix that. So let's go back to this code now. And we've got our document, okay, where we're reserved. I'm going to put a reserve in there uh, just so that we're not seeing any copies from resizing the document as we grow it, okay? And then I make a call to STD reverse here. So what's this gonna print? Anybody? Yeah? And this is C++ 11, but I don't think it matters. More constrictors. What's that? More constrictors. More constrictors. That's good. We got that one. Six copies. Yeah. Not quite. It turns out we get four C tours, four copies. Okay. The copies are coming from inside that reverse call. Okay. Inside the swaps. So we swap that phones. We don't have a swap defined. Okay. That's it with your compiler. That's what it works. Two swaps. Two swaps. No. no. Okay. So now we're going to fix this. 
right? And this gets rid of the Visual Studio problem too. We're going to go ahead and add a move constructor to our object. Okay? So I could write it this way, where I just say, we're going to have a move constructor for our object, and the way we're going to write it is we're just going to move our members. We only have one. Uh, but that's exactly what this is, so let's do that. Let the compiler run the move constructor for us. So we're just going to throw this in. Okay? This is going to fix all of our problems. Okay? So now, even under the debug build in Visual Studio 11, when we call our assignment operator, the compiler is going to use a move constructor, and that's going to work, and we're not going to get a copy there. Um, now, if we go back to this code again, I just get the constructors and no copies. Okay? So I don't have to define my own swap, which is how I used to give this talk. I would always say, you know, you write your own swap. You still can, and if you did, it would be a little bit more efficient than, than letting C11, C11 will use my move in their swap. Okay? And if I wrote my own swap, I could do it a little more efficiently. And doing the three moves around. Okay. Um, for this case. What's that? For this case? Mm -hmm. Maybe, depending on how the compiler in line. Probably wouldn't be much. So, so in general, though, I'm going to say uh, don't bother unless you profile and you see that, that your swap is slow, that those moves are costing you okay. So now you see it prints out our reverse document. Well, there. So providing the move constructor allows copies to be aligned where the compiler couldn't otherwise do. Okay, by just getting that one move constructor in there, we get rid of, of all of the cases where the, the compiler couldn't do it because we had multiple return values, um, because we had uh, a question mark colon operator, because we were returning an, uh, an argument that was passed in. But we can still keep our sync arguments as being passed by value, and I don't have to write two assignment operators, okay? And I don't have to write two of everything else that takes a sync argument, one for the move case, one for the non-move case. And the reason why that's good is because oftentimes you'll have things like a constructor that takes two arguments that are being stored. And so then you get the copy, copy, Move, 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 copy, copy, move. Now you've got four constructors now, just passed by value, moving into place. Can you go back to the last one? Yeah, and we'll probably go right back there. So, actually, in the box. What's my button? Your move from state is a null point, has a null object pointer. Null object pointer. And that's what, until now, there was not a valid state for this object. Why is that not a valid state for this object? Ah. ah, does that matter? What's the requirements on a move from object? What should they be? That it can be destructive. That it can be destructive. Yeah. So this gets into to. Uh, yeah, so just saying that the move constructor just changes it. So. Since I hadn't stated them up front. To, right. to so the here's the thing. What happens if I create an integer? Just say int i. What's the state of i? It's undefined. It's undefined, right? <laughs> Except i is destructible. I can get rid of i. All my other operations on i, okay, are invalid. So that's what we call a partially formed type, okay? So a partially formed type is one where we could assign to it, okay? We could uh, destruct it. Okay? But otherwise, its state is undefined. That's a partially formed type. Object. Okay. Object. object. Partially formed object. Thanks. Uh, so that's a partially formed object. So the requirements for move, in my opinion, I guess, uh, 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 are that the object be, be left as, as a partially formed object. Okay? You could have stronger requirements on it. But those are the minimum requirements for an object that's been moved from. Okay? So, and this is especially true because really <coughs> having an R value, okay, the whole point of an R value is saying it's okay to suck the guts out of this thing because I'm done with it. 
Okay? If, I, if you come along and suck the guts out of something and then use it, you're on your own. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, the general question, because I don't know the answer to this. Uh, sure. Is it acceptable to assign to a move from object? Yes, it is acceptable to assign to a move from object. Okay? Just like I can construct an, an int in an undefined state and still assign to it. Okay. I would phrase it as any operation without a precondition is usable on a move from object. Yes. That is the rule in the standard library. Okay, so, so here my rule is is there is a precondition that says your object be fully and not partially formed for any operation other than destruct and assigning to. That is the same rule. <laughs> that is the same rule in the standard library. Well, that is, yeah. that, that is another way of saying the same thing. You chose a, you chose a, a broader way of saying. Assert uh, <coughs> x dot object in your draw list, yeah. right? Okay. So for a little bit, we're going to take out our decoration, so we're not going to be tracking the copies and constructors anymore. So like that. Now let's take this class and make it a little bit polymorphic. Separate string model type here. So, okay. That we're going to use when we construct it with a string. Uh, so we can't have a unique pointer to an, to an, an int model anymore. So let's replace that to a unique pointer to some concept class. Okay. So our int model and our string model are going to need to inherit from this concept class. Okay? So if you want to corner me sometime after this talk, I can tell you how to do this without inheritance, but we're going to use inheritance as a mechanism. Okay? So we can write our own concept type, where we have a virtual destructor that we're going to default here. And we've got our string model and our int model that inherit from the concept type. So we're going to need to virtualize our draw operation. So we'll add that. Okay. We're going to add a draw for the underlying string type. So we can make sure we can draw that. Uh, we have to fix up our copy constructor here, right? We can't just be copying our ink model. So we're going to virtualize copy. Throw that in our concept and add copies there. Okay. So now, do people follow all that? Okay, so now we can take our document and we can put a string in it. And we get that. So we've got a little bit of, of polymorphism going on here, right? Right? And we, hadn't had, we didn't have to make our string class inherit from polymorphism, and we didn't have to make our int class inherit from something. Okay? And we got a little bit of polymorphism going on. Because it's a copy. <laughs> <laughs> Why introduce a new name? Right. Um, okay, so guidelines. Don't allow polymorphism to complicate the client code. Okay? My client shouldn't have to know that, that I've got a polymorphic use case using the code. Okay? So, we can do better than this though. This code is awfully similar. 
right? It's almost identical. It's like copy and paste code here. What should we do about that? Make it a template, yeah. Okay, there we go. It's a template. Okay, so now instead of constructing a an int model or a a string model, we're going to construct a model of something. Okay. Yeah, we're constructing an electron. There we go. So we take our end model and our string model, and we turn that into a template for a model type. Right? That code was almost identical. Okay. So now, with just those changes, I can go back here and I can add my own class, which doesn't inherit from anything. Okay. And provide the draw operation. Okay. To satisfy my concept, right? My concept is any regular drawable object. Like for me personally, I never say regular, I'll just say drawable, regular is implied. Um, so my document takes any regular drawable object, so now I can put in zero, hello, the number two, my class type, which will print like that, and that's what I get. Okay. What else could I put into my document? A document. I could put a document in my document. I can draw my document. That calls right there. Right? So, this is talking about the runtime run concept of idiom, which is also type erasure. Okay? Allows polymorphism when needed without inheritance. The client is inverted with inheritance factories, class registration, and memory management. Okay? So, it's really simple class of code. Penalty of runtime polymorphism doing it this way, as opposed to doing it through inheritance it turns out, is worst case, the same, right? I still just have one virtual function called dispatch under the hood, but now my client doesn't have to, to new their objects, okay? And my client uh, 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 can deal with their objects in a non-polymorphic fashion if they're not dealing with my container object. So, Marshall spotted it. We can put a document into a document. We don't have to change anything. And now it'll print this. Okay? Why does it not infinitely recurse? Why, Dave, does it not infinitely recurse? Because it's value semantics. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I made a copy of the document into my document, not a reference to my document into my document. So, okay, there's no recursion, there's no problem here. I can put a document into my document. Thank you, Dave. You made my point. My <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> okay, so shifting polymorphism from type type to use allows for greater reuse for fewer dependencies, right? Now when I'm writing my own class types, they don't have to inherit from anything. They're not entangled with the rest of my system. If I want to lift up my class type and drop that into another system, okay, I'm not dependent on the document structure that I created in this app. My class type is completely independent. I can pick it up and carry it over and drop it into another application. Okay. Now I've got this reusable component. Right? Right? So, so using regular semantics for common basis operations, copy assignment, also helps us to you know, reduce shared objects. Uh, regular types promote interoperability of software components. Right? People know how to use integers, so they know how to use, use my document type. They know how to use my object type. Uh, there is no necessary perfor performance penalty for using regular semantics. And oftentimes, there are performance benefits. So, so value semantics, just like uh, uh, functional programming, has benefits in the threaded system. It has benefits in reasoning about my code. I don't worry about infinitely cursive data structures. Okay. Those things just can't happen. Okay. 
Question. Do, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, regular implies default constructible. So, so I noticed that you didn't have. Which I didn't have. And it would create a strange sort of uh, state for your objects. So if you, if well, here it would create an object in conceptually the same state that it would be if it had been moved from, okay, which is a partially formed state. Okay, so, so typically what I will do is I will, you know, in a case like this, is I will construct it with a, a null pointer, with a unique pointer. Okay, so I would just fill it in equal to fall, right, for the construction there. Uh, uh, but I would assert any place I do reference to, just to catch any mistakes. Um, let's do a little demo here. Okay, so we thoroughly messed her up. Okay. 
Now I can't just undo, right? Undo, redo. And I can multi undo, I can walk it back. But over here, what you're seeing is my history, right? This is a vector of all the previous states of my document. Okay, so I've got the document as it was when I opened, and then I laid down a brush stroke, and then I laid down another brush stroke, and I could do something uh, uh, like, uh, let's do some powerful filter, maybe adjust some blur, some <coughs> take our nice crisp image, and blah, blast it out like that. Okay, now you see in my history I've got Gaussian blur. Okay. And I've got that surface, so I can walk back through here, right? And I'm not reissuing those commands. I'm just walking back in, in to previous copies of my document, OK? And if I want to undo a particular little bit, we've got this notion of a history brush, which is right here, OK? And so, oops. I want to maybe go back there. I can paint in the state that she was in when I opened her. Okay, so I can undo a pixel at a time here. Okay, I could uh, uh, maybe I don't like that. I could move my brush back here and say, "Oh, I went a little too far. Put her back." Okay. Um, well, maybe I like that god awful lines that I did there. Okay, so, well, no, but I didn't like the blue. Okay, so Photoshop already had a clone tool, and the clone tool would let me clone from one part of an image to another part of an image, or from one document to another document. And so if I had just a whole big stack of documents for my history state, then I could take my clone tool and say, well, that's my history brush, and I can set a source on it any place back in time, and I can paint from back in time into the future. It's a pretty powerful feature. Okay? Okay? And it came for free in converting Photoshop to value semantics. Okay? Now, how did we do that? Are we making copies? of a 37 and a half megapixel image every time I put down a little paint stroke. Okay. You notice all of my history states are creating separate states of the document. Okay. How much data am I copying here? Anybody guess? Just the stuff that gets changed. Just the stuff that gets changed. So, yeah, so Photoshop itself stores an image, busts it into a bunch of tiles. Okay. So what did we do? We said, well, we're going to give each of those tiles value semantics, but that doesn't mean that we want to be copying it all the time. So we're going to make them all copy on right. Okay. We're going to make every little piece of a Photoshop document copy on right. Every tile is copy on right in the image. Every piece of metadata about the image is copy on right. Every piece of the data structure is copy on right. We took all of the shared pointers in the application, and we said all of those shared pointers aren't pointers anymore. Okay, they're copy on right objects. Yep. Yep. Would actually create. A copy of all of those types of things. Yeah? But Mona, I mean, it's a mathematical transformation. Could you just sort of the original uh, image and transformation that was applied? You could. You could. And there was a version of Photoshop where we took a, uh, a shot at that. The problem is, is then going back in time, you don't have pixels that you can just grab and pull. You have to, at that point, make the copy so you can apply it, so you can suck it into where you are. Right? So, so it's not as easy as it would sound. And when, is, since the blur blurs surrounding pixels, don't you, wouldn't you have problems where it's at the edge of the tile? So, no, because those just get, get cut 
copied as well. Anything that's affected. Right. You, you would have the cost of uh, replaying all these operations. Well, we don't ever replay them. You I mean, would. If, if we do it this yeah. way, yes, we would have the cost of replaying the operations. I mean, for a while there, Photoshop was really pushing up against some of the limits of the computational power of computers. Of computers, yeah. yeah. So, so this we did pretty darn cleanly. Um, so, So we've got a document here, the first <coughs> objects have been typed, we can put documents into a document. So what are, what are we going to do here? Well, in ASL, there's this little library called Copy on Write. It's really a pretty trivial library. It's, it's under the hood, it's a, a rep counted pointer. Okay. The pointer itself is atomic, so it's thread safe. Okay. And it has access methods to read and write, so it's explicit read and write. Uh, uh, we've tried several schemes of trying to be automatically copy on write and transparently copy on write, and for all the reasons that uh, uh, STD string is now disallowed from being copy on write, uh, we found that it just doesn't work. Okay, so we just made make it explicit. So there's actually two methods called on the copy on write object. One called read, which returns to you a const reference to the underlying object. And one called write, which returns to you a non-const reference to the underlying object and makes a copy if the rep count is greater than one. Okay? So it's a pretty simple little class. I can pull the, the definition of it here if you want to. Okay? So, so we're going to create a document of a bunch of copy and write objects. Okay. We're going to change our uh, draw methods to make it explicit that we're reading. Dave? So, uh, I thought that the, the main reason that we stopped allowing copy on write strings was that the strings expose references to their internals. Yeah. And I, don't, I doubt you're doing that here. I, well, because here I'm exposing a reference to the underlying thing, but because I'm doing it through an explicit read or write operation, the rule is, if I say, dot write on this thing, now I have a reference. Now, if forced to copy, if necessary, I have a reference to the underlying object. Okay, And the rule is, I can't make a copy of that and hand it off to somebody okay, without invalidating my reference. So just by making it explicit, then we can specify what the rules are. right? So, and avoid the issues, right? I mean, you could do the same thing with strings if you had a bunch of complicated rules around iter iterator validity, right? Like instead, calling begin could invalidate my iterators. Uh, but that's a pretty nasty thing to have begin invalidate your iterators. <laughs> right? So, it's not so unexpected to say if you call dot right, that invalidated your iterators. Okay? Um, uh, so now we did that. So now we're going to create our history, which is just a vector of documents. And we're going to add just three little simple operations. We're going to have a commit operation that just pushes the back of our history onto our history, an undo operation, which is just a pop, and getting our current history just returns the back. Okay? So just three little simple operations. It's not how it actually write it, but this is simple. So just to see what's going on here, we're going to redecorate our copy constructor to say copy. Okay. Now let's take this code, get rid of all that, and we're going to do this. We're going to create a history with one element for our current state. We're going to take that current state, which is just the back of our history. We're going to put zero and hello. We're going to draw it. We're going to put out a line, so we can see what's going on. We're going to commit our operation. We're going to put out uh, current my class. We're going to change element number one, which was our string that was below, to say world. We're going to 
draw it. We're going to put a line. We're going to undo, and we're going to draw it. How many copies are we going to get? A bunch? One? Any other guesses? A bunch? One? Yeah, there you go. Sucker bat. Uh, oops, I went backwards. Sorry. That's what we get. There's no copies in there. There's not a single copy in there. So we got our document. The zero, hello, end document. We commit that. We got our document with zero. We changed hello to world. We put our document in our document with the state zero, hello. We did that before we changed hello to world. End of that embedded document, my class type that we put in the document, and then we undo it, and we're right back to the state we were at the top. And not a single copy. Unless we copy of an object to the document. What's that? We got a copy of the document. Copy. We do have a copy of the document. Yeah. Right. yeah. We've got a couple copies of the document that we decorated that, but those are relatively lightweight copies. And none of the elements of the document are copies. Correct. Up here? Yeah. I, I see what you're doing and, and I like it. I would have done it a little differently. I would have just had a stack of document states and had a, any document state could be converted into a document. And then you wouldn't have had to have the copy on write for the document itself. Yeah, we don't have copy on write for the document itself. We have copy on write for the objects in the document. Okay. Well, anyway. Yeah. It, it doesn't make, it's not clear, well. Yeah, um, yeah. And in fact, what we do inside of Photoshop is we use a little bit more sophisticated data structures so that if we modify, you know, what happens, we do it this way. If I modify anything at the bottom, it forces a copy of, of any structure at the top. Okay? Uh, but there are more sophisticated data structures that will share sections of the data structure and eliminate part of that ripple. If you want to look at like a, a STD rope, look at STD rope and consider making sections of the rope copy on the right. Too, which is to embed the copy and link capability directly into my object type if I wanted to, and that would actually save me an additional key allocation. Um, and we've got little utilities for doing that.
Yeah, there's actually not a single dot right going on here for the copy on right. Yeah. Okay. So, so that never actually even needs to be invoked here. In some sense, this is an immutable object, right? So this example, I could actually code up with a shared pointer to a const object. But if I wanted to, I could have non-const methods on my object. I just don't happen to have any. I've got one draw method. synchronization uh, uh, between your caches on the machine, but the R value semantics on my copy and write objects eliminates copies of my copy and write objects, which eliminates noise in my rep count getting kicked up and down, uh, which makes it really super efficient uh, up here. Uh, Sean, wonderful presentation, and I'm amazed at how much of it I absorbed. <laughs> the half-life of my memory of complex topics like this is 15 minutes. So, you know, it's three hours after I've left the presentation, I'm losing a lot of it. Yeah. Uh, so is your slide deck going to be available? And, and the other thing I would like to, to actually create and run some of this code, and so I would need the what copy on there was the right oh the copy on right yeah, code the I copy on right code is from ASL okay um, so you can grab that. okay um, maybe maybe I'll do a just uh, uh, strip down a little mini version of the code <coughs> the, on the, on the yeah, so I, I'm just I'm basically I'm I'm really uh, strongly asking because I view this as very valuable and I want to spend considerable time studying it to make your slide that available and it would be great if the code could. Okay, I'll make the slides available and I'll come, come up with a uh, way to get the code. Can you make them available in Keynote? Can I make them available? Oh, in Keynote? Yeah, yeah, I'll make them available in a PDF and a Keynote because the, all the scrolling and, and transitions and stuff. And if anybody wants to know, you know, the way I did all the scrolling in the code here is by replicate, duplicating my slides over and over and over and deleting lines. 
And Keynote, yeah, it, w it would be really nice if Keynote did copy and write. Keynote does copy and gets slower and slower and slower. Embarrassing thing about my question about in camera recursion is that, as Sean knows, I've been through this step myself like you know, 20 times and actually given the presentation an earlier version of the deck yeah. myself because I, this is really important stuff. And I don't know what it says about me that I, that I made that mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it says you no, what it says is getting people out of the mindset of auditory into programming is really hard. I think that's just I've been working with Python the last week. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, Python will work you like that. This day. Yeah. Um, because you're storing a, a stack of documents, the actual, or sorry, images, if you wanted to replay the same sequence of operations on a different image, presumably you store the operation somewhere else too, right? So Photoshop, this has, work. Photoshop has two separate mechanisms, and there's been some talk about tying the two together. I think there might even be a little bit in there to do it. Um, uh, so Photoshop has, has something called uh, actions, okay, which are a recording and playback system. So, and history, which is a multiple undo system. And I think there might be a command in there these days that lets you, uh, given a history, create an action from it. At least there's been talk about it, but I don't know if anybody's done it. Isn't the action system the way that things work in Lightroom? Is that right? No. No. That's pretty different. Lightroom is a non-destructive editing model and fairly different. So actions are literally recording and playback. And the interesting thing about actions are uh, uh, well, a few people here saw my talk on property models. So, if I record an action in Photoshop, like resizing the document, that's my canonical example, okay? The command that gets issued to the application is make my document uh, 300 pixels by 500 pixels, something like that. Okay, that's the command that gets issued at the bottom. So go execute that function. Resize. 300, 500, done. Okay? Uh, but if you recorded that, it wouldn't be a very useful script. You play it back, and it would take all your documents, regardless of their aspect ratios or sizes, and make them 300 by 500 pixels. Okay? So all your documents would be weirdly distorted, unless they all happen to be nearly identical in aspect ratio to the one you started with. Okay. So with Photoshop Actions, we came up with this thing called capturing the intent of the user. So Photoshop won't record, make my document be 300 pixels by 500 pixels. It will record something like, make my document be three inches wide, constraining proportions. Okay? And how do you get three inches wide and constraining proportions? Well, that gets into this thing in ASL called property model. So what we do is we create a model of all the properties that the user is editing and how they all interrelate. And it turns out the user intent, as you flow this graph of properties, is for any state of the graph, you have some set of values within the graph that are source values. Others are derived from the source values. So the source values are moving around. So it turns out there's a very strong correlation between the source values in that graph and the user's intent. Okay. So we can end up recording through the action system, make this document be three inches wide, constraining proportions, and doing make my document be 300 pixels by 500 pixels. And now you've got a script that you can replay on a set of documents, and it will just do the right thing, at least in most cases. Um, so Photoshop Actions, if you look, I think it's, it's right up there with one of the top scripting systems on the planet as far as number of scripts available. There are huge libraries available of Photoshop Actions. Um, uh, huge repositories available on Photoshop Actions. So at one point I looked and we were pretty much on par with AutoCAD scripts, which are you know, 
so, so way up there in the counts, and I'm sure it's grown drastically since then. And that's pretty amazing because actions are just recorded playbacks. There's really no direct way to edit an action. So, which is a long conversation. It's not that I object to editing actions. There's a long conversation about why you can't. Um, uh, uh, so this notion of capturing intent is, is pretty incredible. So, so that notion of being able to play back what you did and this multiple undo history state are two separate entities. And, and somewhat with good reason, um, if you look at things like that you can do in Photoshop, right? I could say paste into Photoshop. Okay? Now the script that I'm going to record is paste. Okay? But it would be really hard to play back paste and get the same results. Unless I also capture the state of the clipboard at the time I paste. It's, it's right? So you get, you know, you don't want your multiple undo to be screwed up by things like that. Can you, um, to, to a naive programmer like myself, the, the, the uh, copy on right thing you made with the reference counting and so on uh, seems to have a lot in common with um, shared point of reference counting, which yeah. you said was problematic. So I wonder if you could distinguish between those for me a little bit and why one is good and the other is not. Right, so the difference between copy on right, which is sharing objects, and shared pointers is with shared pointers to a mutable object, right? If I, if I have a shared pointer to a const object, I have value semantics, okay? So just not attached to the right operators. Well, is that true? No, that's not even true. I have value semantics for a shared pointer to, to a, a const value, okay? Um, uh, but if I have shared pointers to a mutable value, now when I go and I change that value, the other shared, any other shared pointer I have to that sees the change. So I've got a system now that's not thread safe, that's difficult to reason about. I don't have any, it, it, you know, my effects are not contained locally. When I say copy on write, I can have multiple readers of that shared object. But if somebody wants to write it, they're going to tear off the copy. So now it's singly owned, okay, and it doesn't screw up anybody else who's observing that object. So now I've got value semantics again. And now I've got a thread system. Dave? So uh, I guess another way of saying that is that, is that the states of objects are immutable at least once they get shared. If you, yeah, if sure. you have the only reference, then, then it stays immutable and you can change it. But exactly. As soon as you share, start sharing with somebody, then it's locked, and you can't. And you can do all the things. Yep. So there's a writable object and a different set of interfaces and a non-writable object. That was the first thing. So what we do is on the copy and write class, I said we have two accessor functions to give to the object. I have read, which returns a const reference to the underlying object. Okay? So now I can't modify it because I've only got a const reference to it. Okay? I have write which will tear off a copy if necessary and return to me a writable reference to it. Okay? So, I'm just using const well, right? Now, if I say dot write and then I hand off the copy of the document to somebody else and I hang on to that writable reference and go and mutate it, uh, uh, then those writes will be visible to other people sharing that object and that's my own default, right? Don't do that, which is why I say it's an explicit dot write. For a while we had things treating it more like pointers where we had an arrow operator just to star on it, and people would invariably screw it up. Okay? So it was like, no, we're going to say it's right. <laughs> so we do actually allow an arrow operator and star, but they return the const reference. Okay, so. C++ doesn't have deep const. This is just kind of a, So if, oh, if your object has a pointer to a non-const object, even if you say read, you'll get a const pointer to a non-const object. But then you've broken out of the model that you suggested. Yeah, I mean, if you do that, I would tell you that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you get your, you know, yeah. your const reference and const, cast your const this way and start modifying it, well, then you get what you deserve. But I'm saying you run into that problem even without like, a const cast. Yes, I can have 
have a vector of a cons vector of pointers to non cons objects and screw myself that way. And yes, you can. And no, it's you know, a tool with sharp edges. Another way of looking at that, I always have a problem. I know I'm getting the right, I know 
the risks of that, I'll put a little block in there, do a bunch of write, write operations, and then let my reference go, right? And frequently I'll put little curly braces around this, just very explicit, right in here, I've got, got my access to, to my writable reference. And then, yeah, I think I think the difference is you, you work with better programs than I do. I'm not trying to put any kind of safety. Well, I'm sorry, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> you can steal my slide deck and teach a class. If you want it to be safe, and if you're on C++11, what you can do is remove the write operation, and instead just use a modify operation that takes the lambda and you have to follow the operations within that lambda. Yeah. That is a good, good observation, so you too. Have yeah. to really jump through hoops to get the reference out by assigning it to some points that would be added. Yeah. In my case, it was really a pointer to an image. I, I, want to, you know, I need to give access to the raw pixels, but I don't want you to keep access to the raw pixels. And that sounds pretty good, except for the fact that land just have up values. So you can screw yourself in one so. At least you have, to go, <laughs> you have to go out of your way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there is no like absolutely safe solution. So, but I mean, it's like iterators. There's no. As soon as you're dealing with with references, to help, yeah, it's, 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 And I can get into a whole discussion about how no Haskell that doesn't even allow references doesn't solve the problem with object references. Okay. So, for for people who want to know, it's like references are completely unavoidable. Okay, I've got these. Four people in the front row. Okay. Marshall is after John. There's an implicit relationship right there. Okay? And as soon as I have an index that says Marshall is at slot number one, and that's what I'm using to refer to Marshall, Marshall may not be at slot number one. He may get up and go to the restroom. Okay? That index can become invalidated, and that's no different than a pointer becoming invalidated or an access to memory becoming invalidated. It's a bug all the same. References are completely unavoidable. So, in some sense, value semantic programming is exactly as safe as as functional programming. In some sense, right? there's some sharper edges there. Uh, 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 functional programming, in some, in some sense, just kind of provides the solution. Well, you get defined behavior. You get defined behavior, which is uh, Marshall not being there, right? Right. It's about all the same. Except that it's not the behavior you want it, so it's not. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and you know, for any Haskell people, I, I have one of the distinct pleasures. Uh, a year ago at ST Lab, uh, uh, which was um, myself, Matt Marcus, uh, Alex, and Paul Jones, uh, had the pleasure of sitting down uh, with John Backus, uh, who invented ST. As well. Um, this was before John passed away. He was going to write a foreword for Ellen's so programming, and unfortunately passed away before we finished the book and had the opportunity to do that. Um, uh, but we had the pleasure of sitting down uh, uh, with John Backus and discussing value semantics. Um, uh, uh, and he, his comment was that he thought that this was absolutely wonderful and that it always annoyed the hell out of him that FP and this no side effect way of programming had become a religion. And his comment was, I invented Fortran. I understand that the machine has structure and has memory. With FP, I was trying to come up with a mathematically rigorous way to, to program and I understood the complexities of having side effects. I always knew that we had to deal with side effects. I just wanted a structured way to do it. Okay? So, so his opinion, like I said, he was going to write it forward for elements, was that we had a structured way here of dealing with values. So, so if Pascal programmers come to you with their religious arguments, about no modifications and why it's really bad to sort in place. It's not really bad to sort in place. It's efficient to sort in place. And you can't ignore the memory behind the machine. Okay? It's a physical reality of the machine. And even John Backus knew he had to deal with that. Uh, uh, he just did the, the other thing, I mean, with, with referencing and stuff like that, the, the thing is that referencing is a useful tool. It's just not a 
a useful tool of polymorphism, maybe, but the, the concept of uh, the concept the concept of president of the United States and Barack Obama, those are two different things. Those are two different they're, they're currently the same, but president of the United States is a reference to Obama. And you know, that can change. And that's useful. You can do things with that that you can't do if you don't have it. And I do have a talk, which I gave at Qualcomm, is the only place I've given it, um, uh, on references. Like I said, relate, well, more technically, on relationships. Okay? Relationships are unavoidable. Okay? As soon as I have a sequence of things, just like I said, okay, as I have a relationship, I have an implicit relationship. Okay? There is no way to avoid relationships and dealing with them. And I could give a whole hour and a half talk on, on what relationships are and what it means to manage them and you know, why computer scientists are bad at relationships. So there's a whole other talk on that. If, if, if I redo that talk, I gave the talk at Qualcomm, and this was a talk that I've given that really bombed. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, it was like, you know, elements of programming for anybody who started to read it. It was like, you know, that style of talk on relationships and doing that in an hour and a half form just didn't work. Um, but I would try to rework that. Uh, so, value semantic programming doesn't mean that there are no relationships in your code. Okay? Like I said, they're unavoidable. Uh, it's just something that you have to manage. Yeah, just briefly about value semantics and references. Actually, if you regard uh, the presidency of Barack Obama as a point in time, but that doesn't go anywhere that it used to be referenced, that it existed value. So you can just replace it by a new point in time, which is another value. Yes, yes. So it all fits in this same pattern. Hi, Mr. Yeah. 